Atheist Talk on KTNF AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Good morning to all of you joining us locally by radio and streaming online. We appreciate you tuning in. Today is Sunday, uh, March 4th, 2018. I'm your host, Maddie Love, in studio today with Travis Peterson. And joining us by phone is Ali A. Rizvi, author of The Atheist Muslim, A Journey from Religion to Reason. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's conversation. You can send us an email to radio at mnatheist.org, tweet us at Atheist Talk, or send us a message over at facebook.com slash Atheist Talk. Travis, Ali, thank you both for taking time out of your Sunday morning to come on the air with us. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, how, how do I look? <laughs> you look fantastic. <laughs> I got a great face for radio. <laughs> no, it's great. It's, it's great to be on talking to you guys. Well, you know, I want to I want to jump right in, get everybody up to speed um, with your story. You've you've got a unique one. Um, you are you are not the you know normal atheist that we talked to. You grew up in. Uh, not the United States. You have a very, you have a very unique view of uh, of how to come to atheism. Can you? Uh, why don't you just start us out? Like, where did you grow up? Yeah, I um, I, I, well, so I, I was going to address the whole unique thing. It's it's unique here in the in, in yes, the yes. United States and Canada, and uh, I, I'm I'm speaking from Canada, but um, over in that part of the world, it's it's actually not so unique, and it's growing less and less unique as we. As as we speak, which is a good thing. But I I grew up. I was born in in Pakistan, right, which is a, a country in South Asia um, that uh, a lot of people are familiar with. Um, I when I was about five or six months old, my family moved to Tripoli, Libya. Um, so we lived there for several years, and then after that, we grew up. I I grew up in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, mainly. So that's where you know I spent my teens, high school, and so on. And then I went back to Pakistan. So I, I was in three uh, Muslim majority countries. You know, one in North Africa, Libya. One in the Middle East that was actually the birthplace of Islam and the Quran and, and Muhammad, um, the Islamic prophet. And then the third one was in it was in South Asia. So th- three sort of culturally very different Muslim majority countries. Um, and uh, I came to North America eventually to Canada. Uh, when I was 24, so I spent um, most, of, well, you know, by the first 24 years of my life uh, in uh, outside of North America and Muslim majority countries. So, um, and that's the, just like everywhere else. Just like in the U.S., there are people who grow up with religious influences around them. You know, many of them go to church and they they stick with it. And many of them leave, and they start having doubts. Uh, so. I wasn't alone. There are many people there um, in all of these Muslim majority countries that do have doubts, that are free thinkers, that are atheists, agnostics, pro secular, uh, but you just don't hear from them because uh, the it's it's a much greater risk to speak out over there. Um, well, to do a show like this, for example, in in Riyadh would would not be good for you. <laughs> no. Well, to to just to kind of put a point on it, when you in, in the book, you talk about, you know, growing up in when you were in Saudi Arabia, you uh, attended a school for expats and uh, there were you know, people from all all over the world uh, attending school in, in Saudi Arabia. And you were you know, your school was subject to uh, inspection from the uh, from the authorities, the the. I don't know what what you call them in the, in the book um, that would just pop in yeah, to see yeah. if you guys were you know violating any rules. What was that like? Right. So yeah. So what I I went to an American international school in Riyadh. Um, that's still there. It was a great school, and it had uh, students from about eighty different nationalities. Uh, so I had friends from all over the place, and and it was for all. You know, just like American schools here, it looked essentially the same. Uh, the only difference was that, you know, they they obviously had to comply with uh, many of the Saudi laws. So that included, uh, for example, in the winter, you know, you, you wouldn't really talk about Christmas overtly. It was a winter vacation. It was, you know, uh, you know, you'd have Santa Claus and the elves, but you, you couldn't display crosses or talk about Jesus or anything like that. So there was. I mean, so they they just came and they made sure because and the practice of any other kind of Islam apart from or any other religion apart from Sunni Islam in Saudi Arabia is is outlawed. You're you're not allowed to display 
crosses where crosses you know you, you, there there are no churches i was from a shia muslim family and even we weren't allowed to our, our practices religious practices were illegal as well so they had to comply with that uh, so they used to do uh, spot checks and and the story i talk about in the book <clears throat> is uh, at one point we were making snowflakes out of paper and it's kind of interesting because i never really saw snow until i was 24 and came to canada um, so you don't have a whole lot of snow in, in, in the places I grew up in. Uh, but, you know, the snowflakes are nice. They're, they're pretty looking. And, and you, we were cutting them out of, you know, you fold up a piece of paper, you cut into it, and you open it up, it's a snowflake. And uh, we put up the snowflakes, decorated them um, on, on the uh, bulletin board, just on the wall. And that was when the uh, this this guy from the Ministry of Education came and did the spot check and uh, he he talked to the teacher and he was very aggressive with her and he was saying stuff in arabic and i, I don't think she knew arabic and he asked her for a pair of scissors and he proceeded to cut one of the tips off of each of the snowflakes that all of us made all the children and i was i think about 10 or 11 years old um and i i, I all of us were very confused like you know this guy came in he's really upset with these paper snowflakes and he just amputated one of the tips off of each of the snowflakes and just left you know that was a problem that he had and it turns out you know asking questions to the other classmates you know we found out it was because snowflakes have six points like the star of david and um that just wasn't allowed and that was my introduction to jews as uh, when i found out about I was, I, was, I was terrified. I'm like, wow, this must be some really, really serious stuff that, you know, a, a snowflake is such a major threat to them. That it's a, there must be something about the Jews. I wonder what it is. And um, so I, and I just wanted to say, I mean, I was in an American school in Saudi Arabia, and, and this is kind of uh, what was going on there. So imagine what uh, the kids in all of the Saudi schools are um, – experiencing well i imagine they, they never got to experience the joys of making a paper snowflake they didn't but i mean just, just think about just you know the way that they uh the discourse around jews around christians around um, minorities around you know anything that is not that strict ultra conservative uh salafi islam i mean the the uh, there are many uh, i write in the book about some of these textbooks that they have in saudi arabia um even now and uh, there are excerpts in there that that tell teach high school kids, or actually just first graders, second graders, elementary and middle school kids as well, about not to take non-Muslims as your friends. How you know the non-Muslims will betray you? How to fight the jihad and how to die in the way of God and how that is virtuous. I mean, these are things that are taught to kids in public schools. Um, so it's a uh, you know, it's 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 a difficult situation to navigate because, you know, you wonder on the one hand, you you blame them for it. On the other hand, they're they're indoctrinated with this stuff at a very young age, and it's almost, uh, you know, even with that incident, you know, the first time I met a Jewish person when I came to Canada, you know, I had a visceral reaction. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was irrational, but it was something in me. It, it made me uncomfortable, and I wrote about that in the book. And and later I talked to. Uh, him about it, and, and he was from Israel, and now you know, obviously now I have loads of Jewish friends, and you know everything. You know we talk about it all the time, uh, but uh, that I, I detailed that in the book. That you know, if I had that kind of reaction just because of incidents like this snowflake and uh, Star of David incident, you know, you, you can imagine what. Uh, all of the other kids who go to the main Saudi schools, the public Saudi schools. Well, and what they're, what they're and between your school and the other Saudi schools, there was there's very and the other kids that you know that that were Saudi, you you were basically segregated from each other. You didn't really interact with them. You you know you, you your schools didn't interact with each other. Um, is that you know is that fair to say? Right, that that's right. So um, in our school, in the American International School, Saudi students were not allowed uh, to be there. And in the Saudi schools, the foreigners were not allowed to be there. My, my father was a professor at the King Saud University in Riyadh, and uh, it, all they had was male Saudi students. So you, could, you couldn't be, foreigners were not allowed to 
the, the educational institutions were segregated between Saudis and foreigners. So, so what you had was you had a lot of um, you had you had the Pakistan Embassy School, you had Indian schools, you had another British uh, international school uh, that was similar to ours, um, but. Yeah, you know, you didn't have any school where you had Saudis and foreigners mixing. And that is that was that much different than the the culture at large while you were there. Um, it's for the yeah, for the most part, yes. So you know, when you'd go into, you'd have storekeepers, and you know, when you're going about your business and going shopping, and then then you'd interact with uh, other Saudis. The compound that I lived on was uh, the King Saud University compound, the university where my dad taught. So. You know, there, there were Saudis there, but for the most part, they stayed away. Uh, we were also Pakistani, and Pakistanis are really looked down upon. Uh, they actually pay you according to your passport. So, uh, because uh, my father had a Pakistani passport, he was a professor. So, an American would get a lot more uh, in terms of salary than my dad did, just because he was American. My dad was Pakistani. Um, Bangladeshis and Filipinos would get less of a salary. For doing the exact same job, and, and Saudis would obviously get the most. Um, it was still a lot of money at the time. I mean, you know, but uh, th- there was this sort of stratification based on on nationality. So it, it's it, it it's, it's essentially state racism, right? So it's it's a strange country to live in. To okay, grow up in. we are gonna have to break for a commercial. So we'll take a short commercial break. We'll return with our guest Ali Rizvi, author of The Atheist Muslim. You're listening to AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Welcome back to AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota. You're tuned into Atheist Talk. I'm your host, Maddie Love, in studio today with Travis Peterson, and we're talking to author Ali A. Rizvi and a discussion of his book, The Atheist Muslim, A Journey from Religion to Reason. Before we get back to the show, I want to remind everyone listening live that immediately following Atheist Talk, you can listen to American Atheist Viewpoint, an official production from American Atheists. This week, Nick Fish, National Program Director for American Atheists, discusses Billy Graham. And Nick provides a wonderful dose of reality that contrasts with the typical media coverage I've seen. If you miss an episode live, you can always catch American Atheist Viewpoint by subscribing to the podcast version in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you have any thoughts on the conversation we're having today, you can email us at radio at mnatheist.org, tweet us at Atheist Talk, or leave a message on the Facebook post for this episode over at facebook.com slash Atheist Talk. And Travis, back to you and Ollie. Well, for the second segment here, I want to... I wanna... Hopefully not totally butcher uh, a quote that I think I think is from you. Uh, it says the right is wrong about Muslims and the left is wrong about Islam. Is that is that a is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I, I think that's a position that I, I've held for a while. Uh, the quote is actually from a another um, uh, Twitter a, a guy on Twitter named he's called Seeking Reality. I. I can't remember his exact handle. I think it was exposing frauds, but um, it echoed. It actually simplified something that I have been a theme that I have been talking about for many years, and and that sort of is the central thesis of my book as well. Um, you know, which is there is a difference between Islam and Muslims, uh, and uh, Islam is an ideology. It's it's a set of ideas in a book. It's a set of beliefs. Uh, Muslims are human beings. They are people. Uh, there's a big difference between challenging ideas and demonizing people because challenging ideas and attacking ideas and criticizing ideas and debating ideas is what moves our societies forward. And uh, But demonizing people and just targeting a large group of people just because of how they identify um, is what rips society apart. And, so it's, I, and I think that's a really key difference that uh, both the left and the right are not making a clear distinction on, um, and they're not distinguishing between the two. And I'll give an example of this. On, on the left, for instance, if you criticize anything about Islamic doctrine, supposing I say you know, that, that I have a problem with something in the Quran, or I, I think that this is, you know, whatever it is, if I criticize something about Islam, I, you know, they'll be like, oh, well, you're being a bigot against Muslims. Right? So they conflate Islam and Muslims. On the right, you know, they will say, well, there are certain problems with Islam. You know, there, there are 
uh, it advocates for violence, it advocates for domestic abuse and so on. So that means that all Muslims are bad and they all must be surveilled or, you know, banned from coming into the country or whatever the the narrative is. And that also conflates Islam and Muslims. And, um, you know, the, the, the actual, the real picture is very, very different from that. And and this is something that uh, that is a, a, a central theme in my book that I wanted to get across uh, to audiences, especially across North America and and the Western world in general. Well, do you think one thing that I that struck me when I was reading your book is that um, even in uh, Muslim cultures. Um, there is even some of some of this that, that goes on, and, and or maybe a, a misunderstanding um, of what is actually being said. Um, you talk about, you know, reading verses from the Quran to people who you're having arguments with, and them being, you know, surprised or you know, or not believing that that what you just read was was in the book. Like, is is it a, is it a problem on on all sides of just not understanding what the words are? Yeah, I think. I mean, how many people do you know who identify as Christian, for well, example? Yeah, I mean, millions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How, and how many of them actually know what's in the Bible? Come, yeah, I, very few. I uh, the, the the number of people that I've talked to that have actually read it, um, you know, the perfect word of God, actually decided that that was worth their time to read, is about maybe one or two percent. Right, right, and, and that's that's exactly how it is uh, with the Muslim world. I mean. So the first of all, you have to remember that the vast majority of Muslims in the world, uh, the largest Muslim majority countries in the world are non-Arabic speaking. So you talk about Indonesia, which has about 250, 260 million uh, Muslims. That's the largest Muslim population in the world. Non-Arabic speaking. India and Pakistan have the second and third largest uh, populations. Again, non-Arabic speaking. Iran, Turkey, uh, right? Bangladesh. So, so these are... Uh, I mean, they, they don't know Arabic, much less Quranic Arabic, so they have to rely on translations, and even the translations are disputed um, because they say that, you know, a lot gets lost in translation. So, um, and, and moreover, most of them ha just haven't read the book cover to cover. Uh, they, they're, they're shocked at, 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 they're often shocked at when I tell them, you know, what some of the more unsavory verses in the book and it it's confusing to them because they believe this to be the perfect word of god so there's a lot of interpretive gymnastics they say well i'm not a scholar this has been misinterpreted it's been mistranslated it's actually metaphorical and you know beat your wife actually means tickle your wife i, I don't know they they they, they go through a lot of uh, hoops to try and justify to themselves but the question is why do they do that and that's where we need some sympathy uh, the, the reason they do that is because most people who are Muslim are Muslim only because they were born into Muslim families. So even uh, even though you know Muslim linguistically means uh, someone who follows the religion of Islam, you know in this case it's almost a, a birth identity. It's like where Islam is an ideology, but Muslim has become an identity. Um, so people are just born into Muslim families. They become. I mean, it, most of us, if, if you were born into a Muslim family, chances are most likely that you would be Muslim as well. I mean, these things are just accidents of birth. And um, so so when someone criticizes something about their beliefs, they, they take it as, a, as a, a criticism on them personally, on their family, on their heritage. Um, so th th that's why they do become very, very defensive about it. Uh, and th this is also why you know, a lot of times, you know, when you actually show them the what's what's in the book, uh, they're shocked about it because they've never really bothered reading it. And so it's it's a very interesting dynamic. And I, when I look at these pew polls, and I've mentioned this before, is that uh, a, lot, a lot of these pew polls ask a question such as you know, in in these Muslim societies, if if someone leaves Islam, someone becomes an apostate, should they be killed? And you have large majorities in in a lot of these countries like Egypt and Pakistan that say that yes, apostates from Islam should be killed because that is the Islamic punishment for apostates. But when I talk to my relatives, my extended family, and I ask them the same question, they say, yes, apostates should be killed. But then when I ask them, look, well, what about me? I'm an apostate. Should I be killed? And they're like, no, you're nice. We know you. 
You're well, different from the rest of them. And you're one of those no true Scotsmen. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the no, no true Scotsmen. <laughs> and, and it's it's the same thing with the uh, you know like one of the controversial aspects of Islam is Muhammad, who's a prophet of Islam, is. Uh, he he married one of his wives was a a six year old girl named Aisha and you know he consummated the marriage when she was nine and people defend this they say well at that time it was different you know women started or girls started menstruating early and you know he was fifty three at the time and they they justify it and they defend it but when you ask them I'm like what if uh, you know your daughter would you marry your nine year old daughter to a fifty three year old and they'll say no of course not. Yeah, Let's come back. Yeah, Ali, I'm going to have to cut you off. We're going to go to another commercial break. We'll return to our discussion with author Ali Rizvi and his book, The Atheist Muslim, right after this short commercial break. You're listening to Atheist Talk on KTNF, AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Thank you for tuning in to Atheist Talk on AM 950 KTNF. I'm Matt Levin, studio today with Travis Peterson, and joining us via Skype is Ali A. Rizvi, author of The Atheist Muslim, A Journey from Religion to Reason. Before we continue with our conversation, which will be our final segment this week, I wanted to thank our sponsors. All of us at Atheist Talk are asking for your help in keeping secular voices on the public airwaves and in podcast form. Atheist Talk is produced with funding from the Minnesota Atheists and Cucumbers Restaurant in Edina. Please consider visiting our sponsors, and if you do, let them know that you appreciate their support of Atheist Talk. If you would like to advertise in the program and keep us on the air, please contact us at radio at mnatheist.org. This radio program is put together by dedicated volunteers and the generous donations of people like you. It is because of listeners like you that we're able to keep Atheist Talk on the radio and in podcast form. This week, we'd like to thank monthly sustaining donors, Cindy and August. And finally, a thank you again to all of our Patreon donors. If you're able to help with a donation, please consider doing so at our radio fund page. Or for as little as a dollar an episode, consider becoming a patron of the show by heading over to patreon.com slash atheist talk. Minnesota Atheist is a 501c3 tax deductible, tax deductible organization. When we say we couldn't do the show without you, we really do mean it. And we truly are grateful for all of your contributions. Music for Atheist Talk is by composer and member Brent Michael David. As always, check out the Minnesota Atheist website at minnesotaatheistmnatheist.org where you can browse articles, book reviews, and the calendar of upcoming events. With that mischief managed, we can get back to the conversation with podcaster, rock star, and author, Ali Rizvi. <laughs> well, Ali, I want to end the, end the last segment here on a more positive note. So yeah. um, I went back and searched, uh, after I read your book, I went back and searched ta- uh, the hashtag ex-Muslim because, and it was... Uh, wonderful and enlightening and uh and I'd, i really want you to to talk about that a little bit yeah um ex-muslim because uh this was a uh a, a movement for uh, i think it was international human rights day uh, or something that happened a few years ago and uh, it was started by a group uh in the uk that's headed by mariam namazi and mariam namazi is an iranian british uh ex-muslim former muslim um who uh, runs an organization called Council for Ex-Muslims of Britain. And uh, one of the members named Rehana Sultan, uh, who is a Bangladeshi British ex-Muslim, uh, she started uh, this movement called Hashtag Ex-Muslim Because, and, and uh, where people were just supposed to come on and talk about why they rejected Islam. Right? And it was very similar to how people talk about how why they rejected Christianity, why they rejected Scientology or Mormonism, or whatever. Um, but this was obviously loaded because Islam is as unique with its uh, with its sort of political gravity, um, and it went viral. And people from around the world, because you know the the good thing about social media was well, not always a good thing, but in this case, it was a good thing was that people can speak anonymously so so many of uh, many sort of closeted uh, ex-muslims and, and atheists and agnostics around in the muslim world started uh, using the hashtag and and it became the top trending uh, hashtag in the uk uh, for a little while at that time and it it, it was a real I mean, a lot of Muslims kind of got into it. They didn't understand what was going on. They didn't understand that this was such a a, a vibrant and growing movement. Um, so that that was something that all of us felt very encouraged by and very optimistic uh, about. And I, I am actually very optimistic about um, 
uh, all of the work that we're doing. I know that people tend to be cynical about it, but I, I have a lot of reason for optimism. And, and this is just one of those reasons. Well, as, as far as like just a disruptive force, the Internet has proven to be to be that for almost everything. But I imagine for, you know, something like, um, you know, Islam or, or any any religion, really being able to control the narrative is impossible with the Internet. Like you, you, you cannot you you cannot hold people's voices back once once they have it has that been the the thing that's that's turned uh that's turned around in the last you know decade for for islam yeah that's exactly it i mean you nailed it um a, a quote from mariam namazi who I, who I just mentioned is, that i really like and, and that i've quoted quite a, quite a bit is uh, she said that the internet is doing to islam what the printing press did in the past to christianity Right and, and in terms of an enlightenment, so there is an enlightenment that is happening, and you know when when we draw the analog, and I like talking about the enlightenment. I mean, my the podcast that that I co-host with Armin Navabi uh, is called Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. Uh, the reason for that is there is a clear analog in the, in history. We're all beneficiaries of the enlightenment, all the freedoms that we enjoy, you know, the, the equality, the adversity, the the individual liberties, everything that we have here in the Western world is because of people who spoke out at great risk to their lives against, uh, you know, Christian theocracy at the time. And these were, you know, people like Voltaire and people like Rousseau and, and even people like, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson, some of the founding fathers who, who had deist backgrounds. Um, we, enjoy the, the the benefits that that the their ideas brought us now the same things happening in the muslim world and we shouldn't shut it down uh we shouldn't call it islamophobic we we shouldn't call it bigoted because uh, you know that it's actually bigoted to call it that because you know it's like okay the west had its enlightenment and that's fine and now when you know the sort of the brown people in muslim countries not all of them are brown but you know when they want to do it now it's it's bigotry and and that that itself is a form of discrimination well so especially just, with the enlightenment i think that you know we have this this the time that's passed you know like the enlightenment is something that happened you know for for everyone it, it happened in the past it's it's something that you know we've already gotten by and all the repercussions that happened because of it and there were a lot of repercussions um those are also in the past they're ancient history at this point and to deny yeah. Uh, you know the Muslim community that that same enlightenment and that same you know and, and to not be able to know that you know there's going to be pushback and there's going to be problems uh, you know to allow them to have that and and have those conversations is is disrespectful. Yeah, it, it, I, I completely agree with you, and I, I think that actually it, it isn't just a passing; it's something that is continuing. Uh, we're seeing it happen. There's still a lot of problem I mean, if you look at the women's suffrage movement uh, everybody who sits around nowadays and says oh well, we were not interested in politics we're kind of apolitical and they kind of uh, you know disengage they don't realize that a lot of the freedoms that they have uh, a lot of the women who have the freedom to go out and vote it, they happen because of activists that uh, happened because of people in the past who who made great sacrifices the same thing goes for uh, the western enlightenment and i mean if we look at the muslim uh, just to quickly uh, talk specifically about this is it was less than 30 years ago that Salman Rushdie had to go into hiding for 10 years or over a decade just for writing a fictional novel, right? And he had a fatwa, a death sentence against him. It was just two or three years ago that, you know, the Charlie Hebdo attack happened and cartoonists were, were murdered in cold blood for drawing cartoons. Now you go online, there are huge movements. There are conferences with atheists from, uh, you know, the Muslim backgrounds, uh, ex-Muslim conferences. There are, uh, there's the podcast, there's my book, there is, uh, there are <laughs> like now thousands and thousands of Muhammad cartoons online. Uh, that people have started drawing. So there, it, we've come a long way. I mean, to say that we haven't, I mean, we should never downplay the risk of uh, that ex-Muslims face, in, especially in Muslim-majority countries and here in the West as well. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge the tremendous amount of progress that's been made. Otherwise, all of the work that we do is for naught, right? So. Yeah, well, I mean, I kind of liken it to, I mean, the the march for gay rights that that's happened in the last you know i mean 40 years it's it's taken a long yeah. time but in but ever since the the advent of of the internet i mean once you can get your voice out there uh it's out there and, and that, that's a oh yeah i'm, I'm sorry to interrupt I, I i i was gonna say that's a really really good analogy because and especially the part about coming out of the closet i think that uh, people initially thought that you know 
gay people were evil or you know homosexuality is just like this deviant behavior and then they started noticing well my neighbor my co-worker or my kid you know my sister's kid like these people or at you know ellen on tv or will and grace uh, you know and all of these sort of media uh, w- when this started happening became more visible and there was more exposure um uh, to the public then people started normalizing it and i think that that is a is a, is a great analog for what's happening with uh, atheists from the Muslim world. Well, even just this last year, I mean, it's I mean, it's it's not a, a watershed moment, but even even a movie like uh, the big the big sick, you know, like having having right. a guy like Kamel Nanjiani say, you know, on screen, I don't know what I believe. I mean, in even those simple words could be, you know, dangerous depending on where you say them. Right, and I I think that I I think Kamel Nanjiani did a, a, an amazing thing with that screenplay because this is i mean we're living in the trump age there is a lot of anti-muslim bigotry genuinely and and it's 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 made all of our work a lot harder uh, but uh the fact that he just talked about muslim young muslims who are conflicted uh, there are many muslims out there who don't know that they can say that there are many young muslims out there who don't know that they can even say well i don't know about this and when they see him on screen in a movie uh that's that high profile say i don't know you know that that it, it's 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 a it's a really good message for for other young muslims to know that you know okay i'm not alone you know th- this is something that it's not just something that i'm going through a lot of people have doubts about this and i i think that's a first step that's a great first step yeah i mean reading reading your book like i it did it, I, I did end reading it very, uh, very uplifted. I was very positive about about uh, the, the the future, and it wasn't just you know for, for Muslims. It was for any religious, uh, any anybody growing up in a, in a religious ideology. Um, just the the idea that you know you can you can get out. You can think for yourself. You mm-hmm. you you know the the tools are there now, and it's but it may not be easy. You know, but you you can do it and and there are there's a brighter future at the on the other side right and and not only that but there's a community out there for you if you're you know if you're a young muslim or a questioning muslim and you're listening to this uh, there is a group called muslimish where they have uh, they it's a place for questioning muslims believing muslims and former muslims to come together and have a dialogue with this without threat of any you know disownment or death or anything like that so there there's a group like there's a group like uh, called ex-muslims of north america there and these people they have thousands and thousands of members just in in the west alone so you know you can you can look up these groups there are uh, families there's a lot of support uh, for people who have questions where they can get these questions answered and they can meet other people who've been on similar uh, sort of exploratory journeys as as they're going through, and uh, I, I think that's a really important development in the last just I think just four or five years that has happened uh, for uh, young Muslims in in the West and around the world. Well, I I have to say I, I called it at the beginning. I had a thousand things that I wanted to talk to you about, and we got to almost none of them. Uh, <laughs> so I just want to thank you for coming on and and, and talking about this. It was uh, the book is fantastic. It's very enlightening. It's from a unique perspective and uh, uh, and very enjoyable. You know, you're 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 a very good writer and a and a and a good storyteller. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for tuning into Atheist Talk. I'm proud to be on the air with Minnesota Atheists, and I hope that you've enjoyed the show. This show depends on the generous support of our members, sponsors, and donors. Please consider supporting the show through the donation link at mnatheist.org or our Patreon page. This has been Atheist Talk on AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota. All opinions and ideas expressed on today's show were the opinions of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily represent the opinions and ideas of Minnesota atheists. The podcast for this show will be available later today. Hope you have a fantastic Sunday. Remember to milk your bartender, tip your cow, and eat some pork. Please stick around to this brief commercial break for American Atheist Viewpoint.